Good morning. On behalf of the United States Institute of Peace, we are delighted to welcome you to today's event on Why Women Matter to Peace and Security in the Indo-Pacific. We think this conversation this morning comes at an important time and a relevant moment in our global context. My name is Kathleen Keenest, and I lead the Institute's work on women, peace, and security. And I will also uh, serve as moderator for the morning's panel. For those of you who are new to USIP, we are a national institution founded by the US Congress 39 years ago and dedicated to the proposition that peace is possible practical, and essential for U.S. and global security. This coming October, we will celebrate 23 years of the critical United Nations Resolution 1325, which was the first formal declaration made by the international community that recognized the critical role women play in peace building as well as the disproportionate impact and burden that falls to women and girls in war. In recognition of the impact of war on women, the U.S. Congress passed the Women, Peace, and Security Act in 2017, which calls for the United States to be a global leader in promoting women's participation in conflict prevention, management, and resolution, and in sustaining democratic institutions in fragile states. To date, the U.S. is the only country to enact such a law on women, peace, and security. Four departments and agencies were, asked, were tasked with integrating women, peace, and security into their overall strategy. And today, we will hear from one of the COCOMs who will lay out their vision and programs of Indopaycom. During the conversation today, we'll take a deeper dive into how the U.S. military is making what we call WPS, just so you know, we will use that acronym, Women, Peace, and Security, WPS, uh, more than a slogan, and how they're bringing it into their leadership and the implementation of the combatant commands. So it's now my pleasure to shift to our opening speaker, Air Commodore Chris Robson who will offer opening remarks. He will then be joined by our three other distinguished panelists for a conversation about this work. I'm going to only offer very brief bios, but Air Commodore Robson joined the Royal Australian Air Force in 1993. He has served in many sectors of the military, including air combat capabilities, space capability acquisition and operations, and in the role of directing all Australian Defence Force operations across the Indo-Pacific. Among his many duties in J5, he joins us today as the WPS General Officer for indo pacon Command. Welcome, sir, and the podium is yours. Thanks, Dr. Keenast. Um, thank you for uh, wonderful words about what I've done in my past. I've done a bunch of things would be the best description. So um, of all of those things I've done while part of the Royal Australian Air Force and being involved with the US, uh, it's been a distinct pleasure to be involved with what I think is um, the the best operated women, peace, security group of people that we have inside of this organisation. Um, Sharon, who's uh, the lead of that, who you'll get to speak to later on, um, has got a fantastic team, a small team of about five people that do an amazing job and have been lauded across the organisation as the leaders in driving how we manage things inside of a COCOM. So uh, really, I'm the front man for what is an exceptional team, and you'll get to speak to Sharon uh, a little bit later. So without further ado, uh, clearly an Australian, so a little bit strange having somebody in a different uniform with a different voice. For those that have got uh, children and watch the TV show Bluey, apparently I sound like Bingo, Bluey's dad. So as I'm going through this, you can imagine that in the back of your mind. That's who I am. Alrighty, without further ado, um, 
So I'm an Australian Defence Force military exchange officer. So I'm not a liaison officer. Uh, so I don't work directly back to Australia. I'm embedded inside of the US system and work directly for the commander of US Indo-PACOM through the J5 um, in Hawaii. Uh, as part of that role, I've got several different organisations uh, that work with me and in particular WPS uh, is one of those. Um, I'm humbled by the tremendous amount of knowledge experience that I have in the room here and also have online. Uh, USIP's work to provide forums for research, uh, sharing diverse perspectives across peace and security is vital to the understanding of how we can innovatively and effectively resolve today's security challenges. And it starts with inclusive institutions, processes and mechanisms that enable and empower diverse perspectives to confront today's complex security environment. For the US Department of Defence, the Women, Peace and Security agenda has transformative potential for improving security, but it requires effort, strategy and time. Uh, as you previously mentioned, the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325 fundamentally broadens the definition of security by expanding who can become our security partners, those we've often and long overlooked. And women expand our understanding of what makes us secure. These, their perspective improves how we provide security that is both effective and sustainable. We know this by the data. There is strong correlation between gender equality and stability. Factors such as meaningful participation of women um, and incidents of gender-based violence are directly tied to whether or not a country has strong democratic institutions and whether or not they're more likely to engage in conflict. Changes in the treatment of women are also among the first indicators of instability. So the importance of including women and promoting equality to strengthen security outcomes cannot be overstated. Recognising this, in 2020, the Defence Department stepped up its efforts by releasing the first Women's Peace and Security Strategic Framework and Implementation Plan, a critical step in advancing the, the, the approach to promoting meaningful inclusion of women across the spectrum of conflict and crisis. At US Indo-Pacific Command, we established the Office of Women, Peace and Security in 2019. Now, I'll hold there for one moment just to highlight, even though that was established in 2019, Sharon has been working individually with WPS for the past 15 years in Indo-PACOM. So, yes, we started in 2019, but the wealth of knowledge and, and capability that she brings to you know, our small organisation uh, goes without saying. Um, the, it was established in two, 2019 by our command gender advisor, uh, who is obviously Sharon, and she'll talk, you know, further on that role a little later on. Um, as said earlier, we're a small, but what we would say a mighty team, uh, and I'm proud to share that US um, Indo-PACOM has the most robust WPS capability for the Defence Department and remains at the leading edge of Defence WPS implementation. This is because we recognise how critical prevention is to both defence institutionalisation and operationalisation. And, um, and the WPS principles and gender perspectives are key to that. For US Indo-PACOM, prevention efforts means gender mainstreaming with our organisations, tailored training to an inclusive standard to include supporting the command's diversity, equity, inclusion and accessibility efforts, and application of gender perspectives and analysis to our military operations. We recognise this is a dual track approach. In order to truly achieve inclusive security, we need to be working on ourselves within our defence institutions and at the same time, we need to integrate gender perspectives within our military missions. Uh, once again, we'll talk about this a little bit later on. It's not only the outward looking portion of what we do, but it's the inward looking portion that is extremely important to us. Applying a gender perspective helps us better understand the security concerns of the entire population, reduce potential gender blind spots, and identify the full range of risks, resources, and opportunities available to us. It also helps ensure our forces are used to our maximum potential by ensuring we have the right mix of people planning or deployed to achieve mission success. 
As we better understand the security concerns of our partners, especially local women on the ground, we continually adapt our approach to WPS. This requires a learning mindset and also, importantly, a humble one. We need to be able to look at ourselves and understand where we come from uh, and the people that we are dealing with, you know, and, I, and I say this um, with great gravitas, are not stupid, so we can't treat them that way. From a strategic perspective, all US Indo-Pacific Command WPS efforts are guided by a set of principles that emphasise a whole of government, whole of society, multinational and localised approach to WPS implementation. This means we coordinate closely with our interagency partners, especially the State Department and the US Agency for International Development, and we seek to include civil society participation in our engagement whenever possible. In working with partner nations, we also welcome participation from our like-minded international partners and international organisations with WPS expertise. So we haven't got the market cornered. Uh, this week, uh, Sharon and myself have spent today and we'll spend tomorrow in the DC area, working with State Department, working with OSD, talking to other organisations to, to ensure, yesterday we were with USAID, to work with them because they all have perspectives that as a whole of government we may need to be able to drag together and present. Um, we're conscious of the gap between WPS policy and effective implementation. We therefore strive to design initiatives that not only leverage and amplify local expertise, but that achieve contextualise outcomes. This means elevating the voices of marginalised populations who are frequently absent from high level WPS conversations and working to get them a seat at the table. I'd like to provide some examples of recent WPS efforts undertaken by our Office of WPS. Everything starts with relevant data, uh, and Sharon will talk about this uh, a little later. We went to make sure our efforts in the, re in the region are prioritised in a way that is supported by data, not just areas we think are important, and not just in partner nations that we think are important. We think the benefit for WPS is for all. To determine the WPS ground truth in our region, we joined with the Pacific Disaster Centre to develop a WPS assessment of each country in the Indo-Pacific. The index enables us to analyse and understand a partner nation's ability to build resilience to potentially destabilising shocks to better inform our planning. This regional WPS assessment, which also includes the United States and Australia, has also informed how we develop the rest of our regional engagements as well. Guided by this regional WPS baseline, US Indo-PACOM WPS engagements with partner nations focus on the following areas. Now, I'm not going to break these down, and later, if you've got questions on, on it, you can talk to Sharon about it, but firstly, it's the building institutional capacity and capability, uh, inclusive health security, transnational security challenges, and crisis operations. Our Indo-PACOM gender advisor, um, Sharon, as I said later, will we'll expand on that if you want any further details on it. Uh, I guess to keep this short, in closing, we're all well aware that the Indo-Pacific is home to a wide variety of cultures and therefore a wide variety of gender-based challenges. Many of these issues exist due to years of conflict, unrest and instability, and also from the lack of empowerment, representation and perspective of and from women. These issues can destabilise communities and as exacerbate the effects of conflict and crisis. But as I noted earlier, UN Security Council Resolution 1325 is transformative and provides US Indopaycom the inclusive framework to develop concrete actions that could improve the lives of all people. US Indopaycom is committed to advancing WPS alongside our regional partners. That means all of you here today are part of that. So working in that region means that we have reached back to all of the organisations to try to push that into our theatre. Um, we're doing this to achieve mutual goals for a lasting peace and stability. We welcome opportunities and stand ready to meaningful partner, meaningfully partner on WPS. And lastly, we recognise that every nation faces challenges when it comes to full implementation of WPS. Importantly, including the United States. Um, and from my own 
side of things Australia. We're all different. Um, we all are at different points along our journey and have much to learn from one another. I look forward to hearing from the rest of the team here um, and in particular the expert panellists. So um, without further ado, thank you for your time uh, and again, my honour to be in the room and be able to present to you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's working? Okay, great. Thank you so much, uh, Air Commodore, and uh, we look forward to hearing more from you during this panel discussion. Um, I want to welcome our panelists uh, to the, the uh, podium here, and to, uh, I'm going to introduce each one before I ask them a question, only so that it's not a long list of bios, so forgive me um, as I move through this group. So, first of all, um, you know, we want to uh, dive a little bit deeper, and we have uh, panelists here, and I, I will just say who they are, though. Um, on my left in the pink is uh, Sharon Feist, who you've already been introduced to by the Air Commodore. Uh, she is the gender advisor for the U.S. Indo-Pay Com Command. Uh, next to her is Brigadier General Maura Hannigan, who is president of the Marine Corps University. And next to uh, the Brigadier General is our own Dr. Jennifer Statz, who directs our East Asia and Pacific programs here at the Institute. So, um, Brigadier General Hannigan, I'm going to begin with you. Uh, welcome back. Uh, among your many uh, amazing things you've done, uh, as far as uh, your career, you also served here as the Commandant's Fellow during 2015-2016. Uh, and uh, now you are in a whole different ball game than the 78 countries that you have worked in. Um, we'd really appreciate uh, a view of how you see uh, this perspective, some of the, the ideas that you heard from Air Commodore Robson, this whole of institutional approach to looking at WPS really as a both a strategy at the 20,000 foot level, but then implementation at the three foot level, is, or five foot for me. But um, in any case, I uh, would love to hear some of your thoughts also about how you are imagining uh, the gender inclusion at your own institution training uh, at the junior officer level. So uh, the floor is yours, and then uh, we'll turn to Sharon and then to Jennifer. Thank you, Dr. Kuhn. Welcome back. Am I on? It looks like I am. Um, so with that, thank you so much for having me. Thank you to USIP for being here today. Um, I like to say um, I was living in WPS, and then I came to the Institute, and I actually learned about WPS. So what a different inflection to have. And honestly, I'm truly humbled to be here, because I, I really did take away a lot of, of the education that I received here and have been able to grow in that as I've, I've traveled on. Part of the reason I, I believe that I'm sitting up here right now, um, besides the fact that obviously an interest of mine, but was really the amount of time that I've actually had the opportunity to serve in the Pacific as well. And so, uh, you know, one only has to look at the newspaper today and see how the Pacific is influencing the world. And I think that more so than anything really lends itself to an understanding within the military of why it's so significant. Um, and with our partners uh, that we have that are there throughout the Pacific. Um, I would tell you the other side of this too is as the military leans in, um, and I'll use the Pacific Command or, or Marine Forces Pacific, um, they continue to work and, and today is no different. Again, if you look at the conference that they're in, is a cooperation on a, on a multi-level uh, in which they're looking at peace and global security. So I think it's ever important to understand that the militaries readily support these efforts as well. Um, I think probably one of the most influential and in, in to, to the question, um, where have we gone from whether it be at the strategic level or all the way through, my last tour in Okinawa allowed me the opportunity to really have a, 
a greater perspective and, and, and enjoyed really the, the collaboration with the Japanese. I had the opportunity to um, go with multiple individuals across the DOD and go and have a chance to interact uh, with women that were in the Japanese forces. And so being able to truly understand where some of their issues, their concerns, their policies lied, and then how that, again, was reticent or familiar to uh, what we see in our services or where it was completely different. And so um, whether we look at uh, where we feel that we've got a lot of room to grow, I think everyone does. And so that, of course, anywhere that we travel across the Pacific, and 78, once you look at how many countries are in the Pacific, it basically looks like I've spent all of my time there. So um, truly, it's, it's a gambit of countries, and whether that be in Korea or in the Philippines or any anywhere else throughout Thailand, um, uh, Indonesia, absolutely in a, a wealth of opportunity, but never have I ever been anywhere that someone hasn't stopped me from another service, especially other women in the other services, and asked, hey, how did this happen? How did you get here? And, and really what kind of an example uh, that we're able to then provide. And, and again, it'll harken back to USIP. Um, you know, I believe it was Abigail Disney who said, show them what you can be, and then individuals will follow. So it's amazing when you finally see individuals, and, and that's within our own military as well, um, that the opportunities are there. And I'd like to always echo that it's oftentimes less about my military career and the fact that I'm also a mother of three girls. Um, that's usually what everybody uh, immediately warms to. So I would offer that as well. Um, Last but not least, I think it's always interesting, I, I was also here where we talked about empowerment. And uh, the speaker at the time said, you know, women are empowered. Um, it's giving them a platform so that they can use that power is really what we need to be able to provide. And so that's, that's never been lost on me. So now coming full circle back to the university and, and what we're doing at Marine Corps University. So it started well before me. Um, in, in 22, we had the opportunity to take a look at our curriculum across the university. And it, as, as Kathleen mentioned, um, we have the ability to uh, provide instruction from our most junior Marines. Uh, so those 18 and 19 year olds that are, uh, are coming in and pretty much as they get ready to go through in our promotions, um, we start there and, and all the way through our officer corps. But being able to then take the curriculum and look from a women, peace, and security perspective and figure out what are we doing? Um, what do we need to update as far as that curriculum? And more importantly, what are the gaps um, that we potentially are missing, missing at that point? So um, we took a look at it, not just from a military perspective, which I'm really proud of. Um, we went outside from an academic perspective. We looked at it from a leadership perspective. And then we invited subject matter experts to come in and then, again, and provide us some input on where our curriculum is going. We then took that and we were then able to drive that into our cur curriculum review at every level and we are then able to now grow that, that women, peace and security side of our education. So we see that being inculcated with our officers across the board as well as our enlisted. Um, I think where do we really see the benefits of that? Well, we have you know examples riddled across, but we have individuals that are now reaching out and we have partnerships with the Swedish Armed Forces. Um, recently traveled to Israel and got a chance to sit down um, with the Israeli Self-Defense Forces there and be able to talk more about where we are and what we're doing. So those opportunities and that interaction continues to grow over time. I think those the the biggest thing that I've seen as well is our, our scholarship program. We have a, a Reynolds Scholarship Program, which is named after um, a recently retired Lieutenant General Lori Reynolds, who was a foremost expert in cyber and communication. So again, completely outside of where we have seen traditional roles and she was really carving a path and she readily comes back. She actually sits on our board of visitors and provides uh, additional influence over the university and helps us again continue to grow. Um, last but not least, uh, you know, we, we are also able to publish and so our Marine Corps University Press um, gathered not just from the Marine Corps but from across all the militaries and pulled 
pulled into a publication and we were able to produce that last year and provide women, peace, and security in the professional military. So that gave us, again, the opportunity to not just provide one voice, but to provide many and how that voice influences the military across the board. Thank you, uh, Brigadier General. I'm, I'm going to come back to you with a couple of questions, but that was a wonderful way to open up the storyboard here. I'm going to turn now to colleague and friend Sharon Feist, uh, who is the first gender advisor to the commander of the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command and serving as the principal U.S. military advisor on WPS. I, I mean, Sharon, is kind of legendary for us in the WPS world. So uh, to have her here in person, I really want to ask you, like, you're working as a civilian in the middle of a military force. And one of the things when uh, we had time to meet with your team last uh, summer in, uh, in Hawaii was just the impressive way you are translating the grand WPS international agenda, even down to languages, the words you choose, to make sense not only, as you pointed out, uh, Commander, but in a very diverse region in the world. That is tough. But also how you translate from the civilian into the military and back. And I'd love you to uh, talk more about that, but also if you could share what you think are some of the key examples of success and, of course, some of the challenges your team faces on the daily basis. So over to you, Sharon, and welcome. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, Actually, regarding some of that translation and some of the communication techniques, so about 19 years ago, I was a very poor graduate student at American University getting my Master's of Fine Arts in Creative Writing with a specialization in poetry. Um, and you may laugh, and it was definitely my passion and love at the time, uh, but that has really helped with targeting um, very specific messaging and how to make your specific audience understand and feel something in a very cogent and concise and precise um, way. So those skill sets um, actually have translated pretty well um, into the defense and um, security industry. Um, but I'd also like to mention I was also a poor graduate student eating ramen and uh, walking by the U.S. Institute of Peace <laughs> and imagining one day maybe um, I could you know, go inside the building. So um, certainly uh, this uh, feels like I've come kind of full circle. So thank you to Dr. Keen Haas um, for that. Um, so regarding the Indo-PACOM WPS program, as Eric Commodore mentioned earlier, we were formally established uh, in 2019 through Congress, um, through the NDAA, the National Defense um, Appropriations Act, um, even though we have been working on WPS actively uh, since about 2011. And it is a, an evolving approach. Um, Air Commodore mentioned it is a learning mindset, um, and it certainly has been one. Um, we're always learning new things um, and innovatively um, trying to pilot um, new things as well. Um, our main focus, though, and this is what has kind of uh, helped with our success, is understanding that there are two focus areas that we have to deliver simultaneously, develop and deliver simultaneously. So first is the institutionalization, and then the second is operationalization. And you'll hear us using those terms um, quite frequently. So with institutionalization, this includes um, everything that Air Commodore mentioned before, gender mainstreaming, which sounds like that could be easy, but it is not. It takes years for gender mainstreaming, and the number one role of gender mainstreaming is first known the mainstream. Um, so certainly being a civilian um, in the defense and security industry has helped um, in understanding defense culture and leveraging the right processes to influence um, and to also translate the why, why this matters, why this is relevant to defense and security, why women, peace, and security um, is a game changer in achieving um, lasting stability within the region. Uh, the second focus is operationalization. So as a combatant command um, based out of uh, Honolulu, we have coverage of over 36 nations within the Indo-Pacific region. Um, so this is work with all of our partner nations who um, deliver WPS or implement WPS very differently. Um, and where we completely understand that and meet partners where they're at. Um, recognizing that we are imperfect as well, which is why we, of course, still work on the institutionalization aspect um, on ourselves as well. 
Um, by the end of this year, program year, um, we will have been working with over 29 partner nations on some form of advancing WPS, um, of course bilaterally, but also um, multilaterally um, as well. Um, I did want to mention at least a couple of our areas of success, but also um, they translate to challenges as well because we continually have to work on them. And when we first established our program, we realized very quickly that we needed to address two big gaps. The first one is internal training and education. And this meets or fulfills um, with the DOD strategic framework and implementation plan on women, peace, and security. There's three outlined objectives. And the first one is um, about organizing, training, and equipping our forces um, with gender perspectives and also um, how to include WPS principles. Um, so we developed, piloted um, new training uh, to train gender advisors based off of curriculum from NATO, but also from the Australia Defense Force as well. And we knew that we needed to uh, deepen the bench and train the trainers, so we um, established our first military gender advisor course in 2018, and we are continually adapting. In fact, late last night, I was uh, rewriting a new module um, because, again, we're continuously learning about what a comprehensive curriculum needs to look like, and also just training to a standard, um, training to an inclusive standard. The second um, area or gap that we realized we need to address immediately was um, the data, the lack of relevant data within the region to, military, to militaries. Um, so right now, or before, there were a lot of data um, that could come from World Health Organization, United Nations, with indices that were more focused on women's economic empowerment or other um, inequality type of measures. But it was not necessarily addressing drivers of instability, which is what makes it relevant to uh, defense and security. So um, we worked with Pacific Disaster Center, um, who is uh, globally renowned for their work. Um, they are also partly a DoD entity, part an academic entity. And then we worked also with OSD and other, other command commands on developing essentially a gender baseline assessment. And we looked at different indicators of gender inequality, gender empowerment, and then on top of that, looking at the drivers of instability, such as climate change, malign actors, um, et cetera, other transnational threats, um, et cetera. And that really produced uh, basically what we call a WPS responsiveness score for each country. So we have a profile on that as well as a regional score. And as Air Commodore mentioned earlier, we have scores also for the United States and for um, Australia as well. So we're part of um, the scoring of ourselves. Um, but essentially, um, this was important to establish two things. The first was establish a baseline for measurement um, because very importantly, um, and especially for the military, to show different metrics of success um, and be able to do that in a meaningful um, and comprehensive way. Um, and then second, it also informs um, how the Department of Defense can prioritize its security cooperation work with partner nations. And a really good example of this is with Papua New Guinea. Um, it is uh, part of uh, the US strategy to prevent conflict and promote stability. And we knew um, earlier on, based upon its indicators, that it would likely be a country um, that would be nominated for um, uh, for that strategy. And we've been doing a lot of work on there and I'm happy to talk about um, that um, later. Um, and then I think just kind of the last point that I just like to convey, um, and this echoes uh, what Air Commodore said earlier um, about partner nations. We are constantly surprised at how smart and adept and how hungry they are for women, peace and security. Um, this was evident um, most recently when we were in March in Papua New Guinea and then again in Malaysia and Japan in March and May. Um, and having a methodology, a proven methodology within defense of how you build a program for WPS, how you look at institutionalizing, mainstreaming, and also operationalizing, um, seems to be one of the gaps that defense, um, particularly women in defense and security sectors, have been looking for and wanting. Um, and they are um, leaps and bounds ahead of us in many ways, too, in the sense that uh, when we were in Papua New Guinea, um, that was the first group of students 
um, that we've ever taught who actually conducted a gender analysis for an operation, so responding to conflict, and simultaneously conduct a gender analysis on their own organization. Um, and that's something we in the United States um, haven't quite done yet <laughs> simultaneously, but goes to show um, their aptitude and their desire um, for more um, women, peace, and security uh, training and education and partner nation engagement. Yeah, we're just getting going, Sharon. <laughs> You've <laughs> left a lot of things on the table that we want to come back to, so thank you for that. Um, I'm going to shift now to... Uh, our colleague here, Dr. Jennifer Stutz, who directs uh, East Asia and Pacific programs. Uh, she was previously, uh, she served as a director for advanced capabilities at national security staff, spent several years at the Pentagon. So she really does, I feel like, cross sectors and will add to these perspective uh, that we're uh, looking at this morning. But. You know, Jennifer, take us out to the 20,000 foot. I mean, it is in a massive region. As already noted, how many countries are in the region? How, um, you know, can you share some key examples from countries that USIP is working on, how the WPS uh, effort and gender makes sense from a national institution like USIP? Thank you very much. Um, thanks for having me today. It's an honor to be on this panel with all of you, and especially with Kathleen, who is uh, really a, a leader in this and so important to the work that we're all doing on WPS. So thank you very much for, for allowing me to be here and for asking me to speak about the work that USIP is doing on the ground across the Indo-Pacific, the way that so many of these themes and initiatives and efforts are really manifesting themselves in the region. And it's especially exciting for me to get to talk about this because I can't take credit for any of it. Um, all of the work that is being done is really being driven, designed, led, implemented by our amazing partners and colleagues on the ground who are living in these communities who understand the problems far better than I ever will, but also understand the paths to solutions and this path to addressing these problems in an effective way. And so I've learned so much from them, um, from learning um, from their perspective and their understanding of how to best um, really make their communities uh, safer and uh, make their countries better and stronger, and which is, of course, in the interest of all of us. So um, it's, it's really been an honor to be a part of this. So I just want to talk a little bit about three different approaches that we are taking and the way that some of this work that you all have already described um, is really kind of coming through at the local level. Um, and the first is obviously something we've heard many times, the importance of inclusion and in making sure that women have a seat at the table, that they are a part of these conversations um, all along the way, both in terms of uh, participating in the existing processes and structures, but also helping communities design new processes and structures that will make sure they can be, um, they're facilitating a more inclusive discussion going forward. Um, and the first place I'll talk about is uh, Myanmar, which is really um, it, absolute devastating situation right now, really feeling, um, th being torn apart by a, a terrible internal conflict um, being led by the military junta and, and the way that that is challenging um, and, and uh, peace and security, threatening peace and security in the everyday lives of people all across the country. Um, we are working with women in the resistance movement, trying to make sure that they are a part of those conversations, that their wisdom um, is, is, is driving their efforts. Um, and and that resistance movement is pretty fractious. It itself is facing some conflict and division, and we believe that women can play a really important role in trying to unite and build cohesion in that resistance uh, movement so that they are more effective um, in trying to reassert peace and stability across the country. Um, we're also working uh, with some of the groups, the pro-democracy groups that are actually uh, administering territory outside of the area controlled by the junta. So there are some areas that are still um, being controlled by, by civilians and by others. Um, and really trying to make sure that those groups also include women, that they are at the table, and that when they're designing their new administrative structures, security structures um, for this, what we hope, interim period in the future, um, there is a role for women in those conversations. Uh, we're working with police, uh, with community security actors, again, trying to make sure um, that they are thinking about about ways that women can play 
play a role in, in those security institutions. Um, and we're also helping them think about policy changes, whether that's gender quotas in their local administrative councils or other things that they can be doing to really, again, ensure that they're designing these structures in a way that will be more inclusive more inclusive going forward. So um, that's been really exciting work. Again, just incredibly inspiring uh, because it is really being led and informed by the people who know the situation the best and who feel the consequences of this conflict um, most directly. Um, Nearby in Vietnam, we're taking a different approach. It's obviously a very different situation, uh, but working with both military and civilian leaders on addressing issues like war legacies, uh, but also strengthening US-Vietnam relations. Uh, there, we're working with a number of really incredible, impressive women, uh, the vice director of the Military Broadcasting Network, the director of the War Remnants Museum, the president of Ho Chi Minh City Peace and Development Foundation, and the acting president of the Diplomatic Academy of Vietnam, to name a few. Um, there are not a lot lot of women in the most senior positions in Vietnam, um, but there are many very strong and impressive women leaders in positions that are really relevant to peace and security in the country. And so it's been terrific to have a chance to engage them and make sure that their voices are included in conversations with the United States and with others on issues related to peace and security. Um, the next area I'll talk about is um, thinking about the drivers of conflict and what's really um, behind some of the challenges that we're seeing. And there, that th thread of work is really focused on male behavior change and what Kathleen and her team and others call peaceful masculinities, um, in which participants in these discussions really think about different notions of masculinity and how those different ideas affect expectations of men during conflicts or violence. And it's really asking participants to think about things a little bit differently. And, and is it really true that violence is a part of what it means to be masculine? And hopefully the answer is no. Um, in Papua New Guinea, which has been mentioned many times, um, I think many of you know, gender-based violence is a huge challenge. Uh, a recent survey suggests that 56% of women aged 15 to 49 have experienced physical violence, 28% have experienced sexual violence, and that is likely an undercounting based on what we know. Um, it's, a, it's a terrible problem, um, but there are some really uh, innovative efforts underway to try to help um, facilitate conversations to think about some of these challenges in a different way. Um, and uh, you know, it won't be a surprise to anyone here, um, but there is research commissioned by USIP and by others that really, again, affirms what most of us know, that when you're trying to reduce violence, um, it's really important to tackle the causes, and that that's as, as important as, as addressing some of the symptoms. And in this context and many others, that really means changing the behavior and the attitudes of men. Um, that is not something I can do as an outsider. That's not something most of us can do. Uh, that's something that is being really led um, by local leaders, innovators who understand the political, the social, the cultural, the historical, the religious context um, that shapes the way people think about their relationships with others and how violence plays into that. Um, in Papua New Guinea, we have an amazing program manager named Zuabe Tinning. Um, she is an experienced facilitator, counselor, and advocate advocate um, who has really worked on male behavior change uh, across Papua New Guinea and also in New Zealand. And she is uh, conducting this work, doing workshops, doing training, uh, reaching out to men, um, trying to really encourage them to think about their role in their family structures and their community structures and how they can all work together to build a more stable and peaceful society and community. Um, the last piece I'll mention, and I'll turn back, is uh, something that's come up many times, which is the importance of research and data. Um, everything starts with relevant data. We've heard that a couple times today. We need to understand the problem and understand what works and what doesn't work if we're going to be able to address this effectively. Uh, we've done some work at USIP publishing some really impressive research on different efforts to transform the security apparatus in Myanmar, changing it from a really a violent, male-dominated institution um, known for its use of sexual sexual and gender-based violence to a much more inclusive security service that is led by and protects the rights of women. Um, in PNG, we're supporting PNG's own National Research Institute, as well as its longtime research partners at the Australian National University, um, and their very good work to understand better what strategies and interventions are effective in trying to reduce these very high levels of interpersonal and intergroup violence. And, um, 
here it gets really about trying to understand the problem. We're uh, mapping incidents of sorcery accusation related violence and tribal fighting, really just trying to find out where is this happening, what do the numbers look like, and so we can better focus our efforts uh, going forward. Um, and the other really looks at drivers of, of conflict and instability in, in local communities, especially in, in Hela province. Um, this is just a brief snapshot, but I, I think it's important to give um, a, at least a, a few minutes a look at the, the work that's being done on the ground that's really being driven by the communities and the way that these very important concepts and the work that is being done within the US military and Indo-Pacific Command is being reflected and echoed and reinforced and complemented um, by these real bottom-up initiatives in the countries that are feeling this most acutely. So thank you again for the chance to be here and uh, look forward to the conversation. Wow, you covered the world. That was very well done. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, well, Air Commodore, I didn't give you this in the preface, but um, since you are the only male on the panel, and I th think you know Jennifer has covered this uh, question that all of us are looking at in terms of gender. Uh, we always say gender is not another name for women. It is an inclusive, dynamic process that is shaped by society, culture, and practice every day. So you know my question is going to be, what do you think is the outlook for changing these dynamics uh, in male-based institutions, of course the military, but I think what Jennifer brings forward is uh, we see it in everyday life. You know, it doesn't need the military to remind us about uh, this. And the, the only other thing I would add is, uh, in working recently with your government, Australia is taking a very strong stance on gender equality. How does that get translated in your own country and in the surrounding regions? Got me? Yeah, they, they have you. <laughs> I, f I feel like I've been set up here. I've got, a, I've got amazing people next to me and I'm not going to be half as eloquent as what they have been. Um, I, I guess from, from if I start at a baseline from our military organisation as a starting point, um, the how Australia looks at it is that men just have to be better. It's as, it's as simple as that. Men just have to be better. There's a... There's a cultural part of this, there's a generational part of what we're doing, and then there's a carrot and stick part of, of how we need to get after this. Uh, the reality is that um, from the very base level inside of the military, um, our recruiting still is around about 30, 70 as far as female male. Now, if that's your recruiting, trying to get 50% of your leaders to come from 30% of your workforce, the math just doesn't work. It, it just doesn't. So when I look at our institution, we need to be doing a far better job of getting a diverse, and it's not just with regards to women, but just diversity into our organisation. Because Currently, we spend a lot of time looking at how do we actually develop the higher level leadership to ensure we have the right people. Um, unless you have the appropriate pool, that is probably not going to change, not in the short term. So that's one part that we need to get after. The second part is that there is a generational way of looking at things inside of the military. Um, when it comes to WPS, when we go into other nations, Sharon and I were talking about this in the car on the way over, is that... Um, the military perspective is, and my wife would tell me this all the time, is I just need you to listen and hear and stop trying to solve my problems. The military is a male-dominated organisation. That goes without saying. We're trying to rectify that, but that's the reality. So the organisation doesn't listen and hear generally. Their organisation solves problems. So when we go into other nations, understanding that that nation might just want you to listen and hear and not resolve their problems without understanding how that affects them and what the culture is like inside of that organisation is extremely important. Um, and from a marine perspective and from an Air Force perspective, whenever we go into any sort of operation, and my job is to do planning at the moment, is that you never go anywhere unless you've got an exit strategy. You don't 
you don't step off the plane unless you know how to get out. And the times when we haven't done that and recent times in Afghanistan um, and even if we go back to Vietnam shows where we didn't organise that very well. Because of that mindset, we, we don't have presence. So when we go talk to other nations, instead of understanding to build a relationship, to have an influence, you have to be there. You don't go in, resolve a problem, step away, th say thank you very much for coming. The military is not particularly good at that. That's not what we do. Um, so from, from an organisational perspective, those things need to change and we need to be able to look at that. However, that costs money, that takes people, um, and that's just the that's just to deal with that external side of things. So um, it's a it's a difficult problem set that we need to get after. Internal to our organisations, um, Australia is no different to the US. We are, I think, we're doing better, but we haven't got it right, and we've still got a long way to go with regards to gender, whether it be because of sexual harassment, whether it be because of bullying, whether it be because of glass ceilings that can't be broken through. Those things we need to be better at. Um, I can give you an example from an Australian perspective where um, we've got a. Um, a policy, in, in particular bystander training that we do, which has been a significant change in how defence gets after things, um, where a leadership responsibility at all levels not to step past any sort of activities that are not appropriate. And uh, we had a three-star general in charge of the army who created an online video where he was... Uh, criticised quite significantly from the department because he said, um, if you're a person that does this, you are not welcome in my army. You need to leave now. He then went on to say that the activities and the things that you step past are the things that you not only accept, but they're the things that you promote inside of the organisation. There is no room for that. And when it comes to bullying, sexual harassment, they are inside of the Australian Defence Force mandated reporting. If somebody comes to you and says they've been bullied, you don't get the chance to say, right, oh, let's sit down and have a discussion about that's mandated reporting. And that needs to be investigated. Harassment and sexual harassment and any sort of racial harassment, mandatory reporting. If found um, that you have done that, then you're out of the organisation. It's as simple as that. Now, that's a very carrot stick mentality. And hopefully, generationally, we'll get to the point where people, and, and frankly, I think the younger people understand this far better than people that are, frankly, my age. That's, that's, and men in particular. I think it will change over time, but right now that's how Australia is dealing with it. And I think, um, I think the US has similar sort of concepts. I'm not sure that um, there is the freedom of reporting um, that, that we probably need inside of the military to get after that a bit more. Yeah, I think uh, you brought a lot of perspective into uh, just the original qu question of how do you change these kind of institutions. Thank you for taking that leap uh, with that question. So I just want to let the audience know we did get a late start. Uh, Washington is not dealing well with its first reign of I think a month and a half. Um, so we are going to go a little longer here, and I want to be able to get back to each one of our panelists and and revisit some of the opening comments. Brigadier General Hennigan, I'm going to come back to you. Uh, you are really at the, you know, in your current position, looking at those, as you said, 18 and 19 year olds. Uh, their Commodore said, actually, they're a little easier to work with than the rest of us in a certain age group. Um, how does that play out in your work right now? And what do you feel the Women, Peace, and Security agenda brings right now to your situation? So I, I think there are there's an overwhelming growth, and I think you said it well. Is 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 truly the the 18 and 19, 19 year olds do get it. What's more refreshing that I've had recently, or the experience that I've had recently, has been the more senior officers coming in and talking to me. And and one of the the you know focus areas that we've looked at is talent management and that recognition that a hey, talent 
really knows no gender, and, and it really does come at us that way. And uh, I think as the leaders continue to grow and the policies, more importantly, continue to grow, we're seeing where that undercurrent just, again, leads the way. And, uh, and quite honestly, they will follow where the leaders take them. So I think it's a great opportunity. And no matter who's out in front, whatever job is out in front, and we saw that change as well across the military, of any job is open to, to any individual. And really, it comes back to being the very best. And I think for us, it, it comes back to making sure that we do our job well. And so once again, that I think will continue to pervade. Again, it's readily expected at the at the more junior levels, and and they just they just want it so. Um, now that we're seeing it infuse even in our senior leaders, or as our senior leaders continue to ask those questions, I think we'll we'll continue to see that success. Yeah, and I'm going to follow up one more. Uh, how many women presidents have there been at the Marine Corps University? Mm -hmm. And what does that mean in terms of women, peace, and security moving forward? I am not the first. <laughs> no, I was preceded, preceded by another general, another female general, a few back. Um, we are uh, I, I, we ha are one of the smaller services. We do have have less females. We generally run about eight percent in our in our military. So uh, and we continue to see that. Some of it is just. It, you know, I, I think as the Commodore said, it's a it's a clear fact. Um, we don't have medical services in in our in our military, and therefore we don't have a lot of other um, you know avenues that women can serve in where you see that in the other militaries. So we rely on our Navy for that. Um, we are seeing that change over time. We're seeing more women come into uh, definitely at the senior ranks, the general officer, and and then on the enlisted side, our our, our sergeants major, our, our master gunnery sergeants, again is considered that that pinnacle in their field. Um, but again, I think it's just growing across the board. What's always great to see is you see a lot of younger women in the military. And so that's what's always just so so invigorating to be around. So definitely uh, with our younger Marines as they come in, um, you see that really that blend. Yeah, it, you know, often when we talk about women, peace, and security, we do focus on the peace building part. And I'm just wanting to amplify the security side of women, peace, and security. So, Sharon, I am going to ask you, I thank for reminding us that all our skill sets and talents come to bear on our current whatever job we're doing. And I appreciate that because um, young people need to know that poetry matters, language matters, all of these things. So I'm glad you amplified that. I want to come back, though, to uh, the question of we had last summer, uh, and I remember sitting with your team, and we were talking about our gender-inclusive framework and the uh, theory, we call it the gift, and you all said, no, peaceful masculinities is not going to go over in, uh, <laughs> in Indo-PACOM. Tell us what you did with that term and how you workshopped it, really, uh, to make it relevant for your work? Thanks for that question. I think um, it's an evolving approach to training. And we read and listen and take feedback through pulse surveys or different type of data that we collect um, from our training audiences. So interestingly, um, we were asked uh, by our Indo-PACOM leadership to help develop and deliver um, the stand down training um, on, uh, on extremism. Um, and that sort of led into our foray, our foray into um, assisting with diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility type of efforts. Um, understanding, of course, who, who again is our target audience and how to build a curriculum that is effective and that also sticks. Um, so we also um, were asked by one of our directorates to develop a 12 month long, a full one year, train the trainer training um, based upon different issue sets they were seeing within their work climate and environment. Um, so this included issues like harassment, um, different microaggressions, et cetera. Um, so we took kind of a step back and looked at how we would want to develop that um, and build really interpersonal communication skill sets and just building trust um, within each other because we have to have that first 
um, before we can have conversations about masculinity, um, to, be, to be frank, um, within the military culture. So first, um, we were very surprised about how everyone was very receptive to one, having just a safe space uh, for discourse. Um, and then second, how they receptive were, they were to different types of training. And all of our training is very interactive as well. So a lot of different role playing, understanding bystander intervention techniques and tips, different allyships techniques and tips, and also different types of understanding um, your own types of biases as well. Um, so I think one day maybe we can get to the term peaceful masculinity. Um, certainly I think we're aiming for something around healthy masculinity, but that's not something that directly comes into conversations. I do think we indirectly um, are achieving the same outcomes, however. Great, thank you for that. I'm going to conclude our panel with uh, my colleague Jennifer. Um, Jennifer, you sit at the crossroads of so many of these concerns. Um, Looking out five years from now, where do you see us in the Indo-Pacific? Us meaning all of us, not just USIP. But, uh, and how does that uh, intersect with the Women, Peace, and Security agenda? That is an enormous question. I won't get out my crystal ball to try to predict what the Indo-Pacific will look like in five years, um, but I can say it is going to remain um, a very volatile region. Um, there are a, a, a lot of people dealing with a lot of challenges, um, some historic, some cultural, some that have been around for centuries, and some new related to some of the challenges that we're facing based on how the world is changing, the economy is changing, the planet, the climate is changing. Um, and so I think these dynamics will remain, um, will remain um, uh, important to watch and, and, and ever changing. And I do think that these themes that we have talked about today about the importance of uh, being inclusive, of giving women a seat at the table, about thinking about challenges and solutions from the perspective of the local communities and what they understand to be the real drivers of that conflict and the possible solutions is, is really exciting. Because um, I think it's, it's such an important piece of the puzzle in, in addition to all of the other things and policies and initiatives that we have underway. So it's just, it's reassuring and, and inspiring to hear all the good work that's going on. Thanks. Well, with that, I want to thank our uh, four, pa four panelists today um, and the audience online and here at USIP. I want to call out to my colleague, Corinne Graff, who helped us pull this together, Chandy Liu, and others who are here today. Um, I just want to uh, conclude by saying I think this has been a terrific way to really see inside, look under the hood, if you will, of Indo-PACOM. Thank you for being willing to help us do that. Appreciate the perspective from the Marines and, of course, civil society and uh, independent institution here. So thank you very much. Have a great Wednesday, and we're going to go offline now. Thank you. <laughs>